started in slave ships. There are more records of slave ships than one would dream. It seems inconceivable until you reflect that for two hundred years ships sailed carrying cargo of slaves. In the face of the violence that we've been uh, experiencing for the past 400 years, is actually doing our people a disservice. In fact, it's a crime. It's a crime. Cut that off. Let me go ahead and get down to business real quick. Y'all all right? Y'all ready for this one? It's gonna be it's gonna be a weird one for you. Facts over feelings tonight, special edition. You know who I am. If you're new to this show, then you understand what we do here in facts over feelings. First of all, we give praise to the most high. And then after we give praise to the most high, we let you know that if you are not a child of the most high, then you're going to feel kind of out of place. With what's about to go down right now. Today, uh, I'm going to do a little something different. This is not going to be a teaching session. Tonight is going to be, uh, we're going to talk about what's happening in the world. I got a lot going on right now, and I'm pretty sure if you've been keeping up with me through the events of the day, you know that the only thing that's been on my mind, I'm going to jump right into it. I'm not going to waste no time. Go let your friends know that I'm on the air because you know they don't give out no notifications. And they might just go ahead and interrupt us once or twice and so forth. So for the next hour or two, depending on how I flow through this to you, I would like to talk about a couple things tonight that's happening within our black community and uh, before we even get started, I want to salute all of the members of the NFAC. I like the shirt, y'all. Let me make sure that, you know, we can give some of those away. Um, but also, I wanted to salute everybody else that's rocking with the whole situation uh, with the, the NFAC is knee deep in right now. As I told y'all once before, once I get something on my mind, I don't let it go until there's a resolution. I don't talk about it. I try to walk about it. I don't speak about it. I want to take a peek about it. I don't stand back. I want to clap back. So today, if you did not get a chance to tune in, I want to talk a little bit about a very special person to me. I want to lift up an individual that I believe has not been talked about enough and if it has been, it hasn't been talked about enough by the people who need to talk about it from the right perspective. I want to talk a little bit about Breonna Taylor. Yes, Breonna Taylor. Y'all know the story about Breonna. Don't sit there and act like you don't know that Breonna Taylor, 26 year old African-American emergency medical technician, was fatally shot. She was killed by the Louisville Metro Police Department, the LMPD. On March the 13th, 2020, three plainclothesmen, LMPD officers, who claimed that they were executing a no-knock search warrant, entered her apartment in Louisville, Kentucky. Gunfire was exchanged between Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, and the officers, and Walker said he believed that they was breaking in. The LMPD officers fired over 20 shots. Taylor was shot eight times. LMPD Sergeant Jonathan Mattingly, he got injured by the gunfire because he got shot coming through the door first. Another police officer and an LM LMPD lieutenant were on the scene when this warrant was executed. Now, the primary target of this LMPD investigation was a man by the name of Jamarcus Glover and Adrian Walker, who were suspected, suspected of selling controlled substances from a drug house more than 10 miles away. And Glover had a prior relationship with Taylor, so they went there. Apparently, this is their lie that they told, was that, that what they were looking for him, when the fact of the matter was he was already in custody. That's the story that we've all known. That was back in March. Here we are in the middle of July. And the officers involved have not been arrested. One of them was fired, but he petitioned to get his job back. The people involved in this story, there are five of them. We have Brianna Taylor, who is the emergency medical technician who worked at the University of Louisville Health. And her funeral was held on March 21st of 2020. So 
That sister is resting in glory until we all get to judgment and shield. Then you had Kenneth Walker, who was her boyfriend, who lived with her in the apartment. And he was the one who started. He was defending he brought the brothers. He was doing what you should have been doing. If somebody's coming up in the crib and you got the heat, you pull the heat and you defend your queen. He tried to fire. The police came in and they, they, you know, they, they shot the one officer. He went back outside and they shot into the house indiscriminately. Jonathan Mattingly was an LMPD police officer who joined the department in the year 2000, became a sergeant in 2009, and then joined the narcotics division in 2016. Then we have Brett Hankison, an LMPD detective. Hankison joined the department in 2003. Last but not least, we have uh, Miles Cosgrove, an LMPD police officer who transferred to the, depart the department's narcotics division in 2016. If you notice, they all landed in the narcotics division. But we have found out later that there appears to be something else going on, that it looks like that there was a plan to regentrify the neighborhood and that there were some people who just didn't want to move out so they could redevelop the neighborhood. Well, you're not going to guess whose house was on that street. So there was a special team created. This team was supposed to have the job of clearing out anybody that didn't want to go peacefully. Well, now we see exactly what that team was up to. And now that that has become somewhat public knowledge, the situation has taken a very, very interesting and devilish turn because now it means that, well, why would you all be doing this? Why would you be trying to force people out because if the people stayed, they kept their voting power, they could stop this from happening. So they did something called redlining. Redlining is when you draw a red line around certain houses. You know how your neighbor go to one school, but the person live right next door to them goes to another school because they claim they're in a different district just because of where their house sits, but they're right beside each other. That's redlining. That is illegal. And if found out, everybody from the mayor on down loses their job. No credibility whatsoever. So just like with the situation that happened with the Maude Arbery down in Brunswick, where his death opened the whole Pandora's box of some good old boy shit that was going on in the South. The death of Miss Brianna Taylor has stripped back and let us know that there was more going on than a bunch of bumbling cops who ran up in the wrong house. That's how they wanted y'all to take the story. But the digger we deep into this, the more that we find that, you know, the deeper we go, that there's some, some, some nefarious characters running loose around here. And what we found out then was the reason that they haven't done anything, because some of the very people who supposed to do some about it had something to do with it. So, of course, you know, right after this happened, everybody was saying that, you know, that it was a whole lot of stuff that didn't make sense. The police filed an incident report that was nearly entirely blank. That report stated that Taylor had no injuries, even though she died from multiple gunshot wounds. It also stated that there was no forced entry, uh, even though the officers used a battering ram to get into her house. The police said that the technical errors had led to a malinformed report. Y'all can't tell the truth to save your life. Now, all three of the officers involved in this student was placed on paid reassignment pending outcome of an investigation by the police department's internal professionals integrity unit, which was a joke. On May the 20th, uh, the investigation findings were given to the uh, Kentucky Atten Attorney General uh, Daniel Cameron. That's his name. Uh, to determine whether any officer should be criminally charged. I have you know that Mr. Daniel Cameron is still sitting on that particular report and has not issued anything as of yet. And now the joint is beginning to stink and now everybody wants something done. At the end of the day, we are confronted with the possibility that this may go a lot deeper and find out that the mayor uh, may have to bring in some help. So uh, Mayor Greg Fisher, he asked the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office to review the findings. The FBI started conducting their own investigation by the, because everybody's crooked in this joint. Well, a lot of people would wonder, how can a bunch of people be so crooked at the same time? Well, if it has anything to do with their job, it doesn't make any sense. But if you remember what I tried to tell y'all 
about a month ago that all of these symptoms that you are seeing stem from the same place. I told y'all I don't been to every thrift store in the country. I've been to every Red Cross Salvation Army looking for Ku Klux Klan robes and I can't find one nowhere. I can't even get a hood. Shit, I can't get nobody to make me one. Well, I remember very vividly there was a picture from June. Uh, what was it? Um, June 25th. Um, well, let me check out the date, right? It was 1925, was it? When they had 55,000 Klan robes marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. It was huge where all the robes go. They didn't go nowhere. They upstairs in their attics. These are the people that work in all these jobs. The reason that ain't nothing happens is because Kentucky is one of the strongholds of the Ku Klux Klan. Something that people, black people today act like they don't know nothing about. Well, they ain't never did nothing to me. If you knew the Klan like I knew the Klan, then you would know how insidious they are. You would know how sneaky they are. You would know how much of a coward they are. You would know how much they're the same people that tell you, how can I help you? When they're the same people that's blowing up churches with little girls in it, putting people in earthen dams and killing them, riding around in pickup trucks like good old boys, oh hillbilly honky motherfuckers that want to kill you simply because they're inferior to you. I said it. So going up into the, the good old hills of Kentucky, did you really think that something was going to happen? Well, you know what's new in 2020 is that if y'all don't fix this shit soon, something was going to happen. You have to remember what Malcolm X said. The most disrespected person in America is the black woman. Now, Think about what he said then and think about where we are now. And why are you asking yourself why people like Sandra Bland get swept under the carpet and why Breonna Taylor gets no response? Y'all remember the girl in the Waffle House that the cops jumped on and showed all her business to the world and treated her like she wasn't nothing. But, oh, don't let that be a white woman. Oh, they got to call for a female police. I saw the videotape today. The officer is trying to arrest the sister, but the sister has gotten on the phone because she feels threatened by the officer. Did not stop him from folding her up and putting her on the ground and giving her the treatment. Why? Because they have no respect for our women. Now, there are some people that will say, well, they don't respect your women because you don't respect your women. And, you know, I used to buy into that argument, but I'm not buying into that shit right now because of the simple fact is I have nothing but the utmost respect and all my boys got nothing but the utmost respect for our queens. There is a mood floating through the congregation where we are standing up for our sisters, but they know we're doing that. But does that stop them from mistreating our women? No, it doesn't. The only thing that's going to stop them from mistreating our women is if we show up like this and be like, let me ask you a goddamn question. What in the fuck do you think you doing? Can I talk to somebody just for a few minutes? I need y'all to understand that I sat back and I watched this case with intense scrutiny. I was curious to see what was going to happen. I mean, they dropped the charges against the boyfriend real quick. Mm -hmm. They fired one of the officers real quick. But then everything just stopped. Did you notice that? Everything just stopped. See, that's when you run into the core of these KKK minded people. Mm -hmm. You see, the reason that they wear masks is because they want to be hidden. I wear a mask, but when I talk to you, the mask comes off so you know that it's me. When I go out with the NFAC, if you notice, I'll take my mask off, but my people don't. When it's time to speak, I speak with no mask because I'm not afraid of you knowing who I am. I would really like to know who you are. You've been a coward for hundreds of years and y'all can talk that shit online, but when we pull up, you are never know where to be seen. And what you're about to find out is when we pull up, there will be so many of us that you're going to have to call in something much bigger than Billy Bob and the good old boy militia to deal with us because this is what you have created. So today, while the rest of y'all still running around satisfying the definition of insanity, I and my peoples were in discussions 
with the powers to be because I want an answer before we unleash the black horror before I unleash black terror before I let all of these people off of their leash y'all gonna tell me what is the holdup as a matter of fact if I had to put a title on my teaching tonight is what is the holdup if you witness that those of y'all who tuned in because I did not want them to uh, lie about what was said. So you all got a front row seat to my discussions with the powers to be the mayor's office, the police chief, uh, several of the, uh, they brought, I don't know why they always roll out the church guy. Um, but because we don't, we're not, we don't worship the slave master. That doesn't, that doesn't work on us. Something else that does not work on us are phony leaders. Have you ever read the book uh, by uh, Juan Williams? This book right here is called enough. This is the phony leaders, dead in movements, and the culture of failure that are undermining black America. You really should read this book because this book has some rather interesting points. What I would like to pull out of this point, out of this book, is that it talks about something that Martin Luther King said before they killed him. He said the adults who led the civil rights movement 50 years ago saw the potential in young black people to reach the mountaintop. That's all I want to say out of that book. And here's what I want to get to start off with tonight to all my young folks. The reason that you have to take the baton from us is because I've set it up, but I need you to run it to the end zone. You see, I've put y'all in motion, but I need you to execute the play. You see, I have lit the fire. But I need you to go get some more wood and keep the fire burning. Young folks, because see, when I'm gone, you can take it on to the next generation. You see what they've done? They've energized an entire generation of racist white kids who are now growing up and they're just acting out what they've been told. That's why you got all your Karens now. That's why you got all your Carls now, because these are the people who were little kids. They used to run around and see their mamas and daddies doing the things that they want to do now. The problem is the black folks that they're running into, they don't act like the black folks that their mama and daddy told them about. No, they y'all was acting like that at first. Y'all was a little wimpy. Yeah, y'all was a little wimpy. And all y'all standing around, oh my God, I don't believe this is happening. I'm so sick of hearing people saying, I don't believe it's happening. Believe it. It's happening. Get with the program. You know how this go. I had somebody come to me and they said, well, what about the young folks? I see the young folks getting themselves together. I love the brothers in Detroit. I've seen what they did. I love what the brothers in California are doing. I love what the brothers in Louisiana are doing. I love what I'm seeing because it's young brothers who are following an example. But old brothers, my brothers, if y'all don't come out and give the example, don't knock the young brothers when they get out there and they don't know what to do. If you're not going to take your black ass out there and show them how it's done, if you're not ready to show them look i'm gonna show you how it's done i might die doing it but once i'm gone you pick it up and keep going that's what has to happen how do we get to that point we get to that point by not following fake leaders fake movements people who just talk all the time and no action that's how they understand action what you witnessed today was action because they know me well enough by now that if I don't get to the bottom of this, if they don't show us some fruit, if the attorney general does not come back and say, this is what I'm going to do, then y'all know me well enough. And they've seen enough from the NFAC, whether it was in Dayton, whether it was in Brunswick, whether it was in Stone Mountain, they know we are going to take action. So. Y'all know where we at right now. Everybody wanted to pass the ball. Didn't nobody want to make the decision in front of me. So they pointed the fingers at the attorney general. So I have requested a meeting with the attorney general. Mm -hmm. Now, when Mr. Attorney General decides to pull up, not going to be holding you long, sir. Just got one question. When are you going to arrest the officers who killed this woman? And if you're not going to arrest them, can you give me a logical reason why? Because I need to take that back to my tribe. You see, I believe in the old African model of leadership. 
I respond to the will of the people. I do the will of the people. I don't will the people to do what I tell them to do. I do what the people tell me to do. And the people need an answer. <laughs> we, need, we need you to tell us something. Because if you don't, you're going to convince us that you just don't give a shit. And just like Malcolm said, it's either going to be peace for everybody or it'll be peace for nobody. Now, I'm not going to dwell on that too long because at the same time, I need y'all to do me a favor. I need you to stop watching certain channels on TV. I need you to stop watching CMT, you know, the country music channel. I need you to stop watching MTV, MTV2, MTV Classic, MTV uh, uh, Trez, MTVU. I need y'all to cut that off. Comedy Central, Logo, the Paramount Network, Pop TV, the Smithsonian Channel, TV Land, and while you at it, VH1. You got to turn that off. Then you got to turn off BET, gospel, her, hip hop, jam, soul, and don't even deal with the streaming service. Don't even touch it. If you're a fan of Showtime, I need you to stop watching Showtime 2, Showcase, Show BET, Showtime Extreme, The Family Zone, uh, the ne Showtime Next, and Showtime Women. And then while you're at it, I need you to stop watching the movie channel and then flicks and all those other ones. If you're a child and you like to get to hold the remote, don't you turn on Nickelodeon. Don't you turn on Nick at night. Don't you turn on Nick Jr. Don't you turn on Nick music or turn on Nick tunes or teen Nick. All those channels are owned by Viacom. And the reason I say that is because this by now y'all should know that a lot of people got heartburn with the fact that my man Nick Cannon apologized after standing strong on the word because they decided they wanted to fire him. Now, a lot of y'all, let's let's get up to speed. Don't think that because he apologized that he got everything back. He did not. Viacom CBS still ain't fucking with him. His apology only made a difference to Fox. So Fox is going in, they saying they, because they realize they, they need somebody over there to keep them because we already know that that's the racist, most racist network there is. But what I need my people to understand and what I'm going to teach about for a few minutes is that when standing up for what we believe, that's always been a taboo. Now, nobody going to tell you that it's not written down nowhere, but it's, it's taboo. Every time black folks stand up for what we believe, whether we by ourselves or whether we in a group. It's taboo. If someone gets offended by what you did or said, the status quo demands an apology because the other person felt hurt. It doesn't matter whether the sentiments were hurt or not. It doesn't matter whether it was true. That's a messed up logic. But then again, society is messed up anyway. So let me teach on this real quick. Let me tell you about the health hazards of constantly apologizing. When you apologize to someone, you hand them the power. Let me say it again. I got to unpack this real slow so y'all understand what has happened. When you apologize to someone, you're handing them the power to extend forgiveness and appear like the bigger person or to deny the apology and make you feel like crap. In other words, you don't have to step and, and kowtow and, 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 and shuck and jive by giving an apology I apologize. Someone can either accept it and say, OK, I, I accept your apology. Or they can be like, man, get out. I don't want to hear that bullshit. You've given them the power. So when he apologized, what he ended up doing was technically what he did real smooth in front of all y'all. He handed power back to the very people that he sat there and he criticized. He put his judgment in their hands now last time i checked i didn't see a statement from the jewish community i didn't see anything from the jewish defamation league saying you know mr cannon we understand that it was a slip of the tongue and we accept the fact that you've been uh, you see your humility has shown and we accept that i ain't seen that yet yet on the other hand i'm trying to teach my black people something the next time one of these racists get up there talking about, I'm sorry, I don't know what it came over me. We're sorry, I'm just sorry. Remember what they're doing. They're handing you power. And y'all don't execute that power at all. I've shown y'all before when HMS did that clown shit that they did and they tried to offer that bullshit apology. What did I do? I told y'all to tear up their goddamn stores and run them out of South Africa. I salute my South African brothers and sisters who did just that. Meanwhile, over here, y'all still trooping y'all ass up in their stores. 
When you find out that Louis Vuitton used to put black people in a zoo and put us on display. But when it came out, they apologized. What did y'all do with that power? Nothing. You still in there buying a shit. Anytime someone has to apologize to us, understand that puts us in a position of power. Do we accept the apology? No. What we do is say, fuck you and your apology. We're going to get our own revenge on you. We're going to hurt you in your pocketbook. You understand what I'm saying? Your approval of me is more important than my personal feelings. You know this, right? Right. Haven't you found yourself in a situation when you thought I shouldn't have to apologize? And then everybody told you you should apologize because you was wrong. But what you but the reason you don't want to apologize, because the person you got to go and feel you got to apologize to, you probably didn't feel like you would that you need to apologize because you felt justified in what you did. That's why sisters, it's a well known fact that the worst thing that a sister can do is admit that she was wrong and say she's sorry. I know people who have sacrificed their entire marriage rather than say they were sorry. I know people who have lost their jobs, lost their careers, lost college scholarships, lost everything just because they couldn't say they were sorry or didn't want to apologize. I know white people done got knocked the fuck out, unconscious, stripped down and robbed. Why? Because they didn't think they did nothing wrong and did not want to apologize. Now we are in a situation where the United States of America does not want to apologize for slavery, does not want to apologize for Jim Crow, does not want to apologize at all for the way that they've treated people. And then they wonder why they are getting knocked the fuck out and why in fact was necessary. The reason being is when the longer you delay the apology the more somebody begins to think that you really don't give a damn see the problem is a lot of y'all are too comfortable in your skin you see that guilt mainly stems from you unsure about yourself you have fear and anxiety that dominates your thoughts so you don't want to apologize white folks probably want to apologize but they know if they give us the power to accept or deny an apology for slavery that a lot of us will sit there and say, we don't want your raggedy ass apology. We want our money. Run the reparations. Y'all know they know that that's a door that they don't want to go through. You know, it was C. Joy Bell that said life is too short to spend it on warring. Fight only the most important ones and let go of the rest. A lot of us don't know how to do that. You see, you fighting too many battles that leaves your tank empty when you need the energy to stand up for yourself. Choose a battle that has serious long term implications. Let go of the trivial battles. You see, some of y'all so hell bent on winning the battle that you lose the war. You see, that's what we're trying to get you to. This is not a short term process. We're not going to overcome overnight. But damn it, y'all, we haven't overcame shit in 60 years. When you stand up for what you believe in. Like I have, you're going to encounter trolls. I have, you're going to encounter dismissive people. I have, they're picking on you. Doesn't highlight your inadequacies. It highlights their own. Y'all wonder why I don't respond to the trolls. Y'all wonder why I don't get mad when people criticize me. Y'all wonder why I keep fighting for my people when they tell me that you wasting your time. You know why? Because I'm not the one with the problem. They are. So when you come on my page and you start talking trash, all you're doing is showing us how weak you are. When you come on here and you start saying stuff like, ah, oh, you black people are a bunch of fools. No, you're showing us that you're a fool. You see, a stuck pig is always going to holler louder than anybody else. So don't come thinking that that if you don't want to apologize to somebody because you don't want to have that battle with them. Remember, people always accuse you of what they would do if they was in your situation. Maybe they're not the bigger person. When someone is trying to knock you down, sisters or brothers, because you trying to do the right thing and they trolling you and they criticizing you and they running around lying on you. Big shout out to my girl, Meech X. I had to let y'all know right now because you trolls and you never nasty folks ran back to that woman and tried to get her upset about something because y'all didn't want to see us work together. If you go on Meet X page right now, you will see that we already had a meeting. We grown folks. Like I tell a lot of you men, if you have a problem with somebody, don't go online and say nothing sideways. Don't hide behind some little uh, 
Avatar. What do they call it? An Avatar? Don't hide behind some ghost account because you ain't got no spine. Be man enough to go and talk to another brother and see what y'all can do about it. Otherwise, keep your goddamn mouth shut. She was one of those individuals that the trolls went over there and stirred up something. And here's a person that I really would love to work with and that I have nothing against because I told y'all once before, if you're going to listen to the story, listen to the whole story. I already told you when it comes to you people who are mixed race, we're going to examine your mentality. We're not going to look at your skin color. We're going to judge you on your mentality on a case by case basis because some of y'all look like us, but don't act like us. That's what we're not going to allow. But y'all ran over there because y'all tried to be hateful because you ain't got the backbone to step to me because we the pull up masters and it blew up in your face. I keeps my girl on speed dial and we talked and guess what? We got bigger shit to worry about than the fact that you got issues that you can't deal with. I told you this is facts over feelings. If you in your feelings, get help. Meet you went ahead and made your video public statement. I've made mine too. Now, sister, let's get down to work. The other thing we have to remember is that when it comes to these, these types of people, don't be offensive. You see, when you mount personal attacks on someone who pisses you off, that makes you an easy target for an instigator. He declared to the world that you called him this, that, and the third just to gain sympathy. That's why I always teach y'all, even as a race, when someone insults us, don't drop to their level and insult them too. Don't give them the credibility. Don't give them the time of day. I know people right now that's running around still trying to get fame and clout over shit that I did eight years ago like anybody gives a damn. Nobody cares about that. We operate in the right now because just like the old song says, you're only as hot as your last creation. So whatever you did 9, 10, 12 years ago, we don't want to hear about that. That's like a lot of my OGs in hip hop. They get mad when these young brothers don't want to give them their props. The reason they don't want to give you your props is not because we don't like the songs you did back then. It's the fact that you're trying to have an opinion about something that's going on right now. Where's your platinum record? Where's your hit record? Where's your mood music? Where's your song theme for the movement? I got to let that hang out there for a minute because I got a lot of people saying, Jay, why don't you just drop a joint car? In fact, I'm trying to give y'all a chance to do it, but don't nobody want to do it. Y'all want me to lead the revolution and have the theme song too? Okay. If that's what it takes, bust a holler at me. I gave you a holler earlier today. Anyway, so we're going to keep it moving. Sometimes you have to ask yourself this question when it comes to this whole apology thing. What matters more? Does the person matter more or what they said? If it's the latter, if, he, if they having a bad day, is it one time? You see, if it's a one off, you can ignore it. But if it's frequent, do you want to stay connected with somebody who behaves like a jerk all the time? I know I don't. That's why I don't let those people in my circle. So Nick, when he apologized, well, whatever the reason was, some people said he was threatened. I don't know. I re reached out to him, told him to holler at me. If you need protection for real, for real, or you want to get in with the brothers that stood with you, then you need to holler at me. But if you don't, it's going to look a certain way. Remember, silence is betrayal. That's what it says. So it's OK if you want to apologize about something. But just remember, when you do, you're giving that power to somebody else. And you, I haven't heard nobody come back and say acknowledge his apology or anything. You understand what I'm saying? We got bigger problems to worry about, y'all. We got to worry about the fact that 1,004 people have been shot and killed by police in this past year. In, 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 in 2015, five years ago, the Washington Post began to log every fatal shooting by an on-duty police officer in the United States. In that time, there have been more than 5,000 such shootings recorded by the Post. After Michael Brown, y'all remember Michael Brown, he was that unarmed black man who was killed in 2014 by the police out in Ferguson, Missouri. The Washington Post did an investigation that found that the FBI undercounted fatal shootings by more than half. This is because reporting by police departments is voluntary and many departments don't do it. That shows you how much they care about you. They don't even keep a record of when they shoot you. So their data relied primarily on other sources. And after five years of analysis, I got a hold of that report. And what I found out that was interesting was that despite the unpredictable events that lead to fatal shootings, police nationwide have shot and killed almost the same number of people annually, nearly 1,000 
every year. The probability theory might offer an explanation, but we're not going to go into that. What I was interested in was how are people getting killed based on race? Since everybody want to talk about black on black crime, let's talk about cop on black crime. Although half of the people shot and killed by police are white, black Americans are shot at a disproportionate rate. They account for less than 13 percent of the U.S. population, but are killed by police at more than twice the rate of white Americans. Hispanic Americans are also killed by police at a disproportionate rate. So when I looked at the numbers. You know, they have these little percentages. It was crazy because we are so far out distancing everybody else. And the shootings are happening all across the country. They've taken place in every state and they've occurred more frequently in cities where populations are concentrated. States with the highest rates of shooting, believe it or not, the states with the highest rates of shootings. Watch this. New Mexico, Alaska and Oklahoma. You'd be saying, nah, nah, it got to be Chicago. It got to be. No, 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 no. Here's what here's the problem. That database that we looked at contained records of every fatal shooting in the United States by a police officer since January the 1st of 2015. And they keep it updated. You can go look at it yourself. It's on the FBI site. What I thought was interesting was there's this graph that shows you. You know how the shootings are going. When I looked at 2015 to 2020, it went just like this. Ooh, that's interesting. Everybody else shit was going. Ooh. You understand what I'm saying? So something is going on. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Then I heard people tell me, you know, it's because there's high crime in those areas. Why is there high crime in those areas? Well, because people are in poverty. People are losing their, their, the ability to feed themselves. That leads to crime because when you don't have some, anything and no way to get it, you got to go take it. So then that led me down another path. I wanted to look at wealth inequality in America. I hope you're ready for this. Why hasn't wealth inequality improved over the last 50 years? Black people. And why in particular has the racial wealth, wealth gap not closed? Well, I took a look. And what I found out was rather interesting, black folks. The average wealth has increased over the past 50 years, but it has not grown equally for all groups. Between 1963 and, and now, watch this, the families near the bottom of the wealth distribution went from having no wealth on an average to being about $1,000 in debt. Those in the middle more than double their wealth. Families near the top saw their wealth increase fivefold and the wealth of those at the 99th percentile. In other words, those wealthier than 99 percent of all families, their wealth increased seven times. Mm -hmm. So where was all this money coming from? One reason that all this wealth had inequality is because of income inequality. Y'all don't understand what I'm saying. Income is money coming into the family while wealth is a family's assets. Let me teach that to you again. Income is the money coming into the family. Wealth are the assets. Well, what do you mean by assets, Jay? I'm trying to teach you a little bit. Thank you, Claude Anderson. Things like savings, real estate businesses, minus debt, both are important sides of family's financial security. But wealth cushions families against emergencies and it gives them the means to move it up, move them up the economic ladder. Also, wealth is much greater because at one time or the other, it's based on race. And when I looked at the chart, what really blew my mind was that, well, damn, black folks, we are not prospering at all. As a matter of fact, between 1963 and now, instead of ours going up because everybody's getting educated now, it's kind of doing this. That's all it's doing. The Hispanics are actually doing better because they're doing this. But white folks, they shit went straight up. Where do you think they making all this money from? Families of color will soon make up a majority of the population, but most continue to fall behind whites in building wealth. OK, in 1963, the average wealth of white families was one hundred and twenty one thousand dollars higher than the average wealth of black families. 
Now we in 2020 and the average wealth of white families is nine hundred and nine thousand dollars. That's over seven hundred thousand dollars higher than the average wealth of a black family, which is somewhere around one hundred and forty thousand dollars. Hispanics is pulling in one hundred ninety two thousand dollars. To put another way, the white family wealth was seven times greater than black family wealth, five times greater than Hispanic wealth. And despite some fluctuations over the past 50 years, this disparity is higher or higher than it was in 1963. We're doing worse now than we were doing then. Y'all know why? Let me help you out, black folks, is because you went from being creators and distributors and manufacturers to being simply consumers. Y'all just can't wait to give y'all money to somebody else. And now they so goddamn rich that it don't make a difference. They don't give a shit about you. Not only is that, no, listen, let me give you this right here. Not only is it broken down, I'm trying to teach them a little something. They think I'm on some rah-rah shit. I'm trying to tell them that the truth is in your pocket. You want to really hurt them, you hurt them in the pocket. And that racial wealth gap also grows sharply with age. Remember when I told y'all we went down to Brunswick and we went to a, 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 a whatever the place was? I can't. I only want to keep the name in my head. Uh, whatever the neighborhood was, that it was all these old, retired white people living in these gigantic houses, flying Trump flags and shit. White families accumulate more wealth over their lives than black or Hispanic families. Now that widens the wealth gap at an older age. So in their 30s, by the time they're in their 30s, whites have an average of $147,000 more in wealth than blacks. Three times as much. By the time they get in their 60s, whites have over $1.1 million more average wealth than blacks. They seven times richer than you. How you think they put Trump in the White House? They did it with their money. The money you gave they ass. I don't know what I got to do to slap y'all out of that. And it's, it's crazy because some of y'all will sit here and you thumbs up and this is great and teach Jay and all of that and then walk your ass right out there and give the money right back to those people. So I wish you just don't even come up on here with that bullshit. Not tonight. How do we fix it? So glad you asked. Y'all remember last night we talked about the structure for our new ethno nation based on the uh, based on the financial plan, I went into detail of the jobs that we would have to have in order for us to build up our own infrastructure, our own education system, our own wealth and finance. I went all over, over all of that. I went through all of that with you. So the facts and the blueprint is already there. Tonight, I want to focus on two more parts of this plan. And if, you, if you've been sitting there with me, I invite you to take notes because it's going to get to a point where we're going to call on you to help us build out our new nation. Tonight, I want to focus on, the, on one, of the, one of the divisions is the division of public education. And the purpose of the division of public education, if you already do this job, this is what you will be doing in the new nation. Your purpose to achieve is to achieve a higher standard of teaching and students' achievement on entry level involved in the education of black children and youth and to develop a better system of general adult education in all our black communities. I went through this last night, but some of the things that I pointed out are some of the things that y'all can start on right now. We need a, we need a, a foundation for directed research, field studies. We need a, we need a division, a foundation for, for the training of our scholars for neglected areas, those things that they don't teach them. Let me tell y'all a story. I remember back in 2016, 2017, somebody help me out. There was a young lady in Cincinnati, a 16 year old black woman who was a young girl who was a scholar student. She was a straight A student. She was, you know, she was brilliant. She was, you know, she was on her way to college. And then she found out that they weren't teaching her anything that would prepare her for college. They was teaching her common core. She and a bunch of the other bright students, 
in the whole school system got together and said, we're not taking this bullshit. We don't want to be working for nobody. We want to start our own businesses. This bullshit you teaching us is not working. Where is the history that we need to learn about? When do we learn about the dynasties? When do we learn about the pharaohs? When do we learn about Kemet? When do we learn the history of all of the 54 countries in Africa? Where is that being taught at? When do you teach us who we was? Don't tell us that we're slaves. No, we're not slaves. We were doctors lawyers, architects, scientists, you enslaved us. We don't become the slave. There's no such thing as a slave. You enslaved someone. So who were we before then? They got mad that there was nobody to tell them these things. So they said to hell with it. They was all going to walk out of class. The whole school system, they got on social media like they do and they said they was going to do it. And at two o'clock, every student was going to get up and walk out. Now they didn't have a plan. They didn't know where they was going. They were just going to walk out. When the young lady's mother found out what they were about to do and what the police would end up doing to those children, they called me and said, can you please come in and put some sense on the table? So I went and met with the kids, sat with the kids and said, OK, y'all, what's the game plan? What we doing here? And I come to find out what their pain point was, what they wanted. They said, we want to know about us. They won't teach us about us. We ain't stupid. We the straight A students. But they said, we can't use this shit in our world. They, they, they training us to be in a world. I said, all right, then before y'all run out in the street and get beat up by the cops, how about we go sit down with the school board, you and me and us all together. And we talk to them about it and see if we can get those things. And they said, OK, and if they don't give you all the things, I will be the first one to go out there with you so we can test some shit up. How about that? We got a deal. All the kids heard turn some shit up. They was all in. Ooh, we get to turn some shit up. Yes, sir. So we went and met. With the Ohio School Board, we met with the superintendents of schools for Cincinnati, who was an Oreo. I said here publicly, came in trying to bourgeois and smooth talk us and then try to find out, well, why y'all bring him? Because they brought somebody that knew the game. Because after he sweet talked those kids, I took his legs off and said, well, isn't it true that you get fifty thousand dollars for having Common Core in the school? Don't you get that as an addition to your pay? So isn't it to your benefit not to take Common Core out? of? I'm just asking. I want to see some. He didn't like that. But he promised that they will go ahead and put these things in the school. And I came back later and checked and they did. But if we establish our own country, the division of public education would have the responsibility of building some way for our scholars to be taught about those neglected areas in various aspects of our African life and our history. We would have to have a general, show, a general publishing board. These are the people that would write our textbooks and other works related to the progress of our race and our history. We would need our own newspapers, our own magazines, our own professional journals, our own community action newsletters. We would have to have a committee of visitors. These should be in every community so that when you come to these communities, you become acquainted with the teachers, the students, the textbooks and all of the learning materials. They would have the job to determine to what extent, if any of the anti-African or anti-black feeling on the part of many teachers, of black youth may be hidden, may be a hidden obstacle to their progress in schoolwork. In other words, if you one of those teachers and you got these attitudes, you can't teach in our school. We don't give a damn who you are, what kind of credentials you got. If you come in there because you got some self-hatred issues and you think we're going to let you take it out on our kids, you sadly mistaken. We're not going to do that. Every committee of school visitors should be elected by the people of the community and should report directly to them. Look what I said. Not report to somebody, the governor, the mayor. No, the people put you in there. So guess what? The people are the ones that you got to report to. The division of education would justify its existence if it did nothing more or less then conduct studies as a basis for proposing certain guidelines for the race of the United States. That's something that y'all need to think about. That's a lot to unpack. That's a lot to unpack. I want to talk about something else real quick that we would have to have inside of this new world that we want to build. And that's something that a lot of people don't think is important. I believe it is the most important part of us building a black nation. The Commission for Spiritual Life and Assistance. Listen to what I said. The Commission for Spiritual Life and Assistance. This should be the race's great commission. 
its major tasks would be the determining the direction of our civilization. To interpret the spiritual as men and women working on the highest level of humane endeavors to understand the meaning of life or trying to improve it. If you don't know who the most high is, then you can learn about that. If you are still trying to shake off the shackles of the slave master religion in this new country we built, then this is the people that would get you cleaned up. That, now, here's where my allies come in. You see, we would enlist the cooperation of white, brown, yellow, red, and any and all other peoples of goodwill in an all-out drive for a better world. We're not saying you can come be a part of us. We will work along with you. Another function of this department would be to maintain an emergency assistance program for families or communities in distress. See, if we build our own nation, it's not going to be kumbaya. We're going to have some hard times. But we should have, look, look, people shouldn't have to worry when they fall on hard times in a real community like that. They should be able to go to get emergency assistance. But see, in this society, we're not going to let you lay around to become a cancer. Everybody will be gainfully employed because you're going to get a job whether you want one or not. Because we're going to abolish what they do. Because we're not working for someone. We're working for ourselves. Don't y'all remember what I said last night? But we own all the businesses. I'm going to stop right there. Time for me to go take my break. And when I come back, uh, we got to talk about H.R. 6666, which is coming knocking at your door soon with a vaccine to put you in the position of whether or not you're going to take it or not, because they know we're trying to get up out of here. We already know that what's in those needles is something that's going to kill you, not going to save you or going to help you. They don't want you to do that. They, they want you and everybody else gone. Why? Because if they can't have you the way that they used to have you, they would much rather kill you. And y'all don't You're believe that. From investors. I, I don't want that right now. Thank you. So I need y'all to come back and join me. We're going to talk about H.R. 666. We also got to talk a little bit about um, what, where do we go from here now? Because I know my NFAC members is raring to go. I heard some of y'all was booking plane tickets and people was going out getting their uniforms together. And y'all know what the uniform is. Black boots, black pants, black button down shirt, black mask, shotgun, semi-automatic weapon or um, or rifle. Pistols are going to be on your thigh, in your thigh holes, or going to be in your shoulder, and you must have a permit. Well, in this particular case, we check the laws where we're going. You won't need that. In other words, this is going to be a lottie dotty. Everybody bring everything you got to the party. And so we're going to find out very soon whether or not we need to do the damn thing. And if you missed out on the last formation for whatever your reason, you about to have a chance to get it right this time. I'm talking to my black folks. You see, the goal is that by the end of the summer, I'm looking at us having a million two a formation, a million black guns exercising their Second Amendment rights in one place at one time. A million of us together strapped up, shawty, in an organized formation, shawty, coming to send a message to the world, shawty. OK, so when I come back, we're going to talk about that. But until we get to that point. I need y'all to stay close to me because when I make this announcement, y'all know we don't put out flyers. We don't specialize in advertise. What we do is we make sure that you get the word. And the way we do that is the old African way of word of mouth, which means if you don't hear it from me, you haven't heard it at all. That's the truth. I'm going to take a break here on Facts Over Feelings. I'll be back. And when we come back, we're going to get into a couple of more things before I cut you loose tonight. As I'm awaiting a scheduling of a meeting with the attorney general for the state of Kentucky regarding Breonna Taylor. Y'all come on back and holler at me, please. I hope y'all come back. I hope you find it in your heart to come back and uh, and we'll go from there. Once again, I bid y'all a shalom on this um, Thursday night. 
Uh, we are already into the middle of July and they were so quick to lock folks up yesterday and give them felonies. They gave them felony charges, um, but they can't seem to find the get their wherewithal all together to go out and arrest these officers. They killed my fellow sister, Brianna Taylor, who I'm giving this whole show attention to tonight. I'll see y'all on the flip side. Remember, I'll be back in about five minutes. Just make sure if you don't get the alert, please check back. Let your friends know that this facts over feelings and I am the Grandmaster J. I